Give me one second, please. Okay, good morning to everyone. And I just wanna welcome you to our service this morning. We're continuing our study on encounters with Jesus. And we've been looking at several different people who had the great uh, opportunity to meet Jesus in person and to spend some time with him. And we're especially focusing in on the impact that Jesus had on their lives. And um, last week we were looking at the woman that Jesus showed mercy to, the woman that was caught in adultery and her encounter with Jesus. And we saw how while others wanted to stone her, Jesus wanted to save her. And, and that's the lesson that we take away from that story is that, that uh, rather than to show what we believe is justice, we should seek to show mercy to others in, in the situations that we get into. This morning, I want to talk to you uh, and focus on Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Uh, there's a great story there. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Um, we read in John chapter 3 and verse 1 that there was a, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. The first thing I want us to consider, something that really stands out to me, is the fact that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. We're told that Nicodemus was a Pharisee and one of the Jewish ruling council. And that's talking about the Sanhedrin, which was a, a, a group of Pharisees who were selected to, to be a tribunal. They were the leading scholars of the Old Testament and the supreme religious and educational legislative body. Uh, we might compare them to what, what we see as the Supreme Court. And we know that the Pharisees were constantly harassing Jesus, that, that they despised him. They were constantly looking for ways to trap him and discredit him and later arrest him and even have him killed. And, and so they had this, this real strong hostility toward Jesus. And we read in, in John chapter 8, in verses 1 through 5. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Another passage in Luke chapter 6, we looked at this last week, just, just emphasizes their animosity toward Jesus. In Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? 
he entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some of, to his companions. And Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another occasion, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all, and then he, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. This was the typical attitude toward Jesus of the Pharisees, that they, they really despised him. They didn't like what he was doing, what he was teaching. They felt intimidated and maybe even a little bit fearful of losing their disciples to him. And so they were constantly trying to find fault in him, discredit him, do whatever they could to get rid of him. But Nicodemus was one of these Pharisees. And it says that he went to Jesus by night. And I have to ask the question, why? Why by night? I mean, was he too busy to go during the day? Or, or maybe it was that Jesus was so involved with all the others uh, teaching and healing and so forth that only a, a, a Maybe at nighttime, they could have a peaceful conversation together. But I really think that the reason Nicodemus did, went by night was because he was fearful of being ridiculed and harassed by his fellow Pharisees. You know, in John chapter 7, in verses 45 through 52, uh, just one of the three mentions of Nicodemus in the book of John. Uh, in John chapter 7, verse 32, the chief priests and Pharisees had sent temple guards to arrest Jesus. They were fed up with him. And then in verse 45, it says, finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. I mean, this, this is what Nicodemus feared. That, that if he, he showed any interest in Jesus or, or showed any desire to, to talk with Jesus, that he would be ridiculed and possibly canceled, losing his status and and respect among the people. And so he came by night to talk to Jesus. And you know, I think Nicodemus represents a lot of people today who are interested in knowing more about Jesus, but they're intimidated by all the skeptics, by their peers, by their college professors, by the educational elite. It, it's it's something that a lot of people struggle with. They think that if they, if they show some, some interest in Jesus, that they're going to be laughed at and mocked and thought of as stupid. And so they never say a word. But Nicodemus at least had the courage to come to Jesus by night. 
And here's the thing. Nicodemus acknowledged that Jesus was from God. That's what's a huge admission. And notice he says, we. That's interesting. Who are the we? It says, we know that you are come from God. I, I believe the we are other Pharisees, maybe who are afraid to say anything or afraid to go and, and see Jesus themselves like Nicodemus. But Nicodemus had the courage to go to Jesus and then admit, admit that he knew that Jesus was from God. That, that no person could do what Jesus was doing except God was with him. That's a big admission. And again, there are many people today who I believe deep down inside know that Jesus is the son of God, but they're either too prideful or they lack the courage to confess Jesus as their Lord. You know, we read in Romans chapter one about the judgment of God that's coming on those who don't confess Jesus as their Lord. It says in verse 18 of Romans one, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godly, godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Listen to this. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their, fut their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, that if anyone confesses my name before men, I will confess them before my Father in heaven. But if anyone denies me, I will deny them before my Father in heaven. You know, whatever it is that holds people back from really pursuing an encounter with Jesus, an authentic encounter with Jesus, and, and knowing more about him and, and ultimately making him the Lord of their lives. Whatever's holding them back, that has to be overcome. That has to be overcome. And Jesus makes that clear to Nicodemus in this passage. In reply, Jesus declared, verse 3 of John 3, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the spirit. You know, Jesus just cuts to the chase here. And he, and he goes right to what Nicodemus had come to him about. You see, Nicodemus knew that God was going to establish his kingdom and that he would raise up a leader to, to lead that, to lead the people into the kingdom. And, and he wanted to find out if Jesus believed the same things he believed about the kingdom. And here we learn that, that Jesus thinks that he's not right. He says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And this word see means to perceive or understand something. And, and what Jesus was really saying is, Nicodemus, you don't really understand what the kingdom of God is all about. You see, the Pharisees believed that God would reestablish restore power to the nation of Israel physically as a theocratic world power on earth. But Jesus was trying to explain to Nicodemus and to us that his kingdom wasn't like that. In fact, in John 18, in 
verse 36, it says, Jesus said, after Pilate had asked him if he was the king of the Jews, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus said, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. In other words, to really understand the kingdom of God, you got to understand that it's not a physical kingdom. It's not a material kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom that is within us. Jesus was telling Nicodemus he would never understand the true nature of God's kingdom unless he was born again. And then he says in verse 5 that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. And the word enter has to do with the idea of becoming a citizen of the kingdom. In Philippians, Paul talks about how we are citizens of heaven, that our citizenship is not here on earth. The only way that we can really enjoy the full benefits of God's kingdom is by being a citizen of that kingdom. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus encouraged everyone to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things would be added to him as well. And the whole book of Matthew is really a discussion about the kingdom of God, what it is and what what kind of attitude the people would have who would become citizens of that kingdom and what, what their, their duties and responsibilities would be. And the, the benefits that we would reap from being a citizen of God's kingdom. In first Peter, you know, talks about this and, and, and we understand that, that there's an inheritance for us in heaven. There's peace and joy and hope and everything else that God provides us both here on earth and will provide for us in heaven. And so here Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he will never be admitted into the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Think about how that must have impacted Nicodemus. He's a man of above average scholarly knowledge of God's word. And the one that everybody looks to for interpretation of it. And now Jesus is telling him he doesn't understand the kingdom and that he's not going to be able to come into the kingdom unless he is born again. This is really, really important. That's true for all of us. I mean, think about it. It's not how much you know about the Bible or understand about the Bible. It's not about how religious you are or, you know, how good you are. Or, or those things don't matter in this context. Nicodemus had all that. We must be born again. Jesus says in verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So what does it mean 
to be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. And there are three ways that the word again could be understood. It could be understood first as going back to the first or from the beginning. It's used, it's actually translated from the beginning, that same word again. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 3, where, where Luke talks about writing the gospel of Luke and, and, and going back and tracing it from the beginning or tracing it again. It also could be understood or interpreted as born again, and again in the sense of a second time. And really, that's where Nicodemus was focused on. He was thinking, how can that happen? How can I enter back into my mother's womb and be born a second time. And then a third way that it, it's understood and sometimes translated is to be born from above or born of God, not of something physical or earthly. And really in this passage, all three are meant. In 2 Corinthians chapter five and, and verse 17, It says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And I like the King James Version says, all things are become new. To be born again means that we start all over from the beginning. That, that we need to to start a new life again. And that that happens by being born of God. That we now have a new way of thinking. All things are new, a new way of thinking, new choices, new priorities, new desires, new goals, new actions, everything. Everything in your life is new. It's different. He was telling Nicodemus that he must begin a totally new life. Not just make the old one better, but a totally new life. And in Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4, and there's many references to this new life in the New Testament. But in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, it says, since then you have been raised with Christ, and we're, that's talking about being raised with him in baptism, and we're going to talk about that. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life now, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. The idea of being born of water and the spirit means the, the water here represents our part in this conversion, our part is in baptism. And, and throughout the Bible, there's references to, to water being used as, as a cleansing. And Ezekiel, and I have to think that maybe he was thinking about Ezekiel 36 verses 25 through 27 when, when he said this, it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you 
to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You know, we know that in baptism, that that we die to the old man. It's, it's so important to understand what we're doing when we're being baptized. You know, people that downplay the importance of baptism don't know what they're talking about. It, it's not just important, it is essential. Because in baptism, that's when we make a decision to follow Jesus. And, and that we make a decision at that time to die to our old self completely, to put to death the old man of the world of sin, to put to death that old attitude, to put to death that old worldview, that, that old sinful thinking, and to be buried in baptism with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life, to be born again, in other words, to start all over, to begin a completely new life in Jesus with, with a new focus and a new mind and a new attitude and a and, and new passion and new goals and all those things. Baptism is that starting point. And the spirit in this passage, born of water and the spirit, that represents God's part in our conversion. When we're baptized, that is when God replaces that old heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh and places his spirit within us to move us to follow him. And I think about how important the spirit is in our lives and changing us and making us into what God wants us to be. This is absolutely essential to understanding the kingdom of God and understanding how we are to get into the kingdom of God. They're absolutely necessary. You know, when you read this passage about Nicodemus, it's, it's interesting to me that it ends in verse 21 of John 3, and Nicodemus is never mentioned again until chapter 7. There's no mention of Nicodemus ever being born again or converted. And, and what's interesting to me mostly is verse 21. Whereas Jesus finishes this conversation with Nicodemus, this encounter that he has. He talks about in verse 20, he says, Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. I don't know if he's making a little play on words here, but I think he is. He says in verse 21, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he does has been done through God. Is he telling Nicodemus here, he needs to quit hiding in the dark. He needs to quit coming by night. And he needs to come in the open. He needs to come out of the closet and, and show that God has come into his life and, and has given him rebirth. You know, we don't know. It's, it's never stated in the scripture if Nicodemus ever was baptized and born again. But it, I think it's strongly implied. It's in, implied, first of all, in that passage I read earlier in John chapter 7, where, where Jesus is being made fun of by the Pharisees, and Nicodemus stands up to him, stands up to these Pharisees, and, and he, he tells them, is 
is this the way that we treat people without really talking to them first? And then they begin ridiculing Nicodemus as well. But we see this, this courage to push back on their attitudes toward Jesus, maybe giving us the implying to us that Nicodemus has had, had a change of heart and, and he's coming into the light. He's becoming more bold about his relationship to Jesus. But it's actually in John chapter 19 that really makes me think that Nicodemus had to have, had to have been converted. It, it says in in John 19 and verse 38, and this is after the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. By the way, Joseph of Arimathea was also a Pharisee, and a very wealthy man. So with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation. And since the tomb nearby, they laid Jesus there. couple of things I want to point out. One is that Joseph of Arimathea, who was also a Pharisee and a secret follower of Jesus, was accompanied by Nicodemus, who I believe was also a secret follower of Jesus, that, that he had, he had been born again, that he had come to, to truly believe in Christ and surrender his life to Christ. And, and he was coming into the light now so that they may see that God was working in him and changing his life. The question I have to ask you this morning is, have you been born again? You know, it's it starts with Believing in Jesus. Believing that his teachings are truly from God. That, that they are perfect. That they are the truth. And that by embracing them and living by them, we are actually living out God's will here on earth. The way that God had planned us to live from creation. That we, that we must completely em, embrace the teachings of Jesus. In John 8, 31, 32, Jesus, Jesus said to the Jews who have believed in him, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And, and so we must start there, just, just accepting Jesus' teachings as from God himself. And then believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, If you do not believe I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. And who did Jesus claim to be? He claimed to be the Son of God. He said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. To be born again, we must believe that with all of our heart, that Jesus is truly God's son, the savior of the world, and the only way that we can enter through the kingdom, into the kingdom, is through him. We must believe that his gospel is sufficient. 
he goes on to tell Nicodemus in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus would go on later to tell his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who disbelieves will be condemned. To be born again, we must believe in Jesus and not just give mental assent to it. You know, in James chapter 2, I think it's verse 13, it says, you believe that God is one God? Good for you. The demons believe that and shudder. It's more than just believing. It's, it's when that belief has an impact on how you live your life, how you think, and the choices that you make. You must obey his command. And the first command that he tells us is to be baptized. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 36, Peter, when he preached the first gospel sermon to those, those who were in the crowd that day, he, he says to them, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Now that, that phrase, cut to the heart, that means they were deeply convicted by that. They, they were experiencing an authentic encounter of Jesus. It was an epiphany in their life. It was a matter of, I helped put to death the Messiah, the Lord. And so they're crying out to Peter, how can we fix this? What can we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. We must obey Jesus in baptism, dying to ourselves, repenting of our old, old way of life, our sins, and, and surrendering our will and our complete life to Jesus. You know, Paul talked about this in Romans 12, 1, where he said that, that we must offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable worship. And then we need to obey the Lord in everything that he has commanded. In Matthew 28, when, when Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples, he said, Go, into all, go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Everything I have commanded you. And so when you read through the Gospels and you see all these teachings of Jesus about the Beatitudes, the kind of attitudes that, that Christians are to have, those are, those are commands that we are to obey. The whole Sermon on the Mount is about those commands that Jesus calls us to obey. And to be born again means that we embrace that, that, that we do our very best to live that out in our lives. And then you must be born of the Spirit, or, or live by the Spirit. And, and the whole idea of when you're baptized, God gives you the Spirit to live within you. That, that from that day forward, you, you are going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, to convict you, and to move you to do God's will. 
I think about how the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to lead us, to direct our lives, and how when we study the word of God and, and we, we read these commands or, or we're, we're instructed from God's word that, that it pierces our hearts and it causes us to want to do those things, to want to be led by that. And the Holy Spirit uses our conscience to convict us, to, to really drive home that, that God has a different plan for us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the motivation. I, I love Philippians 2, verse 13. In verse 12, it says that we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling for Verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. God in you, the Holy Spirit in you, wills you, moves you. You know, there's been so many times when, when I've just felt God's moving. You know, been at the grocery store and saw somebody in need and, and felt moved to go and speak to that person. I just heard a story recently. My wife was sharing with me that, that Virgie's daughter, Cindy, was down at the beach and, and it was Virgie's birthday and she was praying that God would help her never lose the feeling of her mom's presence in her lives. And she had taken a flower down there and she was throwing petals into the water and, and someone up on the street, witnessed that and saw that. And he came down to her and he said, you know, I don't know what you're going through right now, but, but I felt moved by God to come down and tell you that God loves you and God is with you and he will be with you to help you. And Cindy was so touched by that, so moved by that, that that, you know, to know that, that when she really needed God's working in her life, that, that God brought this person there to, to confirm that he was there for her, to help her. We need to experience the Holy Spirit in our lives to know that it's real, that he's really trying to lead us, that he really does convict us, and that he really is trying to move us in the direction of God's will. And then we must just walk with the spirit. Galatians 5.16. You know, the idea is that, that, that throughout our day, not just on Sunday mornings when we're listening to a sermon or a Bible study or, or when we're in our quiet time reading and praying, but, but throughout the day that, that we allow the spirit to lead us, to make choices and decisions that are in accordance with God's will for our lives. And that when we do things that are not according to the spirit, that we're convicted by that and we change and we do the right thing. In chapter five of Galatians, verse 25, he says that, that we must walk with the spirit and keep in step with the spirit. And I take that to mean that we're always striving to be more in tune with the spirit that lives within us so that we might allow him more control over our lives and the things that we do. Not just walk with the spirit, but keep in step with the spirit, looking to the spirit for those things. I wanna close with a passage of scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, and this is the Apostle Peter. Many years later, he writes to Christians and he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. 
I want to ask you this morning, can you relate to Nicodemus? Maybe you were raised in a religious family. You've gone to church all your life. Maybe you read the Bible daily and you say your prayers regularly and you fulfill all the religious requirements asked of you. But have you ever really had an authentic encounter with Jesus? An epiphany where you were humbled and surrender yourself to him? What we all need more than anything is an authentic encounter with Jesus. Jesus can change us no matter what our life situation is. He can give us peace and hope and joy in the most desperate circumstances, but we need to have a life-changing encounter with him. Whether it's for the first time or to renew an old relationship, the, the good news is that he's waiting to meet us there. I want to invite you to come to Christ this morning. If you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus, a, a, an authentic encounter with him, he stands ready to meet you, to greet you and to change you. And if you haven't been born again, you can do that today. And I'd like to help you. If you're ready to change your life and give your life completely to Jesus and encounter him anew, I ask you to, to let me know. Get in contact with me. And let me help you. Let me help you to give your life to him in baptism, to receive his spirit from above, and to give you some hope of direction in your new life with Jesus Christ. Let's uh, close out with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you for all that you do for us. I thank you for your great patience. And Father, I know that there are so many who go through life who never really have that authentic encounter with, with Jesus. And we know that it's possible. Father, I've experienced it. I know it's, it's real. And I just pray for all those that are listening this morning that, that they will really revisit their, their religious life, that they'll look at it and, and ask themselves, you know, am I... Am I really just going through the motions or, or am I really living by the Spirit of God? Have I really experienced that new birth that the Bible talks about, that being born again of the water and the Spirit? Father, I pray that if there's anyone out there that has not ever done that, that they will come to the light, that they'll come and, and say that they want to give their life to Jesus and be baptized and Father, if, if there are some out there who have already done that, but they have strayed away and, and just kind of fallen back into the ritualistic living of their religion, Father, I pray that they will repent this morning and, and that they will seek your face again and want to have that, that encounter with you again to feel your presence in their life. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Jimmy. Thank you all. You can unmute. Thank you. Good message, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Excellent, excellent message. Excellent message. Thank excellent. you. Really. Right, well, Face it. Holy Spirit doing what he do. I think you're still recording. Yes. Thanks, Kim. <laughs>